Welcome back to Earth Central. Today, we have a special guest, one of our partners who is joining the discussion regarding EUDR. It's Adam Grant, Business Development Manager at Double Helix, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Uh, thanks, Olya. Um, yeah, so Adam Grant, uh, working with Double Helix, uh, primarily looking at business development and new opportunities. Double Helix is a, uh, an organization that's working on um, sustainability and uh, due diligence within supply chain uh, work globally. We have offices spread across the world and staff available across the globe in Southeast Asia, Africa, and America, North America. Uh, I'm based in the UK along with Darren, the CEO of Double Helix, both in UK. Uh, my background <coughs> is uh, prior to working with Double Helix, I was Business Development Director for Preferred by Nature and I've also worked down in Southeast Asia for 20 years, uh, private equity and then working with Rainforest Alliance uh, in Indonesia and NGOs in China and I was work work working with the World Resources Institute in Washington DC as a senior associate working on their forest legality uh, program which was funded by USA. I think the burning question of the day is what's your take on European Union anti-deforestation regulation as in do you think it is going to move the needle when it comes to sustainable supply chain, supply chain traceability and halting deforestation? Uh, yeah, it's, it's an evolution of where things are going so I, I'm for sure it should um, change things. Um, we're already seeing in the marketplace that companies are starting to consider what they need to do in terms of their due diligence. Um, prior to this, or still now actually as we speak, uh, you've got the European Deforestation Regulation, you've got the UK Timber Regulation, <coughs> which, you know, uh, there is a level of due diligence required, uh, but that's more focused on legality uh, of right. timber, when the European Deforestation Regulation is much more looking at not only legality but sustainability, you've got your sustainable uh, considerations and community which is a really important point of it, so you've got indigenous rights but you've also got community rights which you're probably going to have to consider with community rights in terms of how they equate to the law of the land where you're buying from, so uh, all of these things have to be considered and then really importantly is the geolocation, so tracking back to source which um, is, is always been sort of tacitly considered but no one's really um, done it properly and now the regulations require people to really understand where they're buying things from which they always should have done you know the business models we have today <coughs> don't and don't require people to do that and I think many organizations and groups and companies have free road the system so having that requirement that they do understand where they're buying things from is quite a powerful part of the regulation and then, of course, you've got the declaration that needs to be signed. You've got the customs declaration. And once you have to sign a document legally to say that you've done your due diligence against all these requirements, that sharpens up thinking quite a lot. Um, you know, my time at World Resources Institute, part of that was working uh, on the um, development of the Lacey Act um, from where it was into including timber and then having a declaration for imports over there. And you saw in the marketplace there the, the requirement for doing a declaration for importation really did make people think quite um, carefully about where they're buying things and where they're going to do their due diligence. That was going to be my next question is do you think it's really going to um, set some things in motion in terms of you know companies truly inspecting their suppliers and then changing the suppliers if they see the suppliers not compliant or do you think they're still going to try to um, you know, <laughs> try to get some things slip through the cracks, let's put it this way. Well, yeah, maybe they don't have to change their suppliers, but I think potentially they're going to have to work with their suppliers to understand the supply chain more. So um, there's no reason, hopefully, that people would have to change, but I think that all the way down the supply chain, they should ask questions more carefully about where they're buying things from. So if, if the data's there, the information's there, you know, company being taxed along the system. If you're getting taxed, then the information's there, the data's there, so uh, potentially we, it is possible to track back. It's going to take some effort. Um, but if that effort is there and the will's there, and potentially if the fees are there, um, you know, we may well end up having to pay a little bit more for our products, then you should be able to track back to source. But um, 
Yeah. There is that consideration whether it is possible to do that, and, and there may be a, a, tr a change in supply chains, which is good and bad. You could cut out some of the bad actors, but then that pushes the bad actors to go somewhere else as well. So we have all these considerations. And then you have the problem that potentially it will just be the bigger companies who will be able to do this, and it pushes out the SMEs who won't be able to trade within the marketplace, which is a real concern. And that's what we're trying to do at Double Helix. We're putting systems and tools together <coughs> to actually help the SMEs to meet the requirements of this so they don't get pushed out of the, out of the supply chain so they can work to this regulation. Uh, please remind me, do SMEs have the obligations to comply with EDR or is it more voluntary for them? There is a requirement, yeah. It's, it's a bit less than the large operators okay. and the large traders, um, but yeah. We need to get into the finer details, but yes, there is still a requirement to do due diligence. In your experience, the whole sustainable sourcing, has it always been um, driven by the legislation or is there like a chunk of companies who do it just because they've decided to make it their business model? Yeah, well, you could look back at um, where certification came from, really. Uh, I started my career timber trade in the end of the 80s, early 90s, for a company called Mayers, um, uh, Montague Mayers, and we, we traded uh, timber globally, um, and that was back at the time when, at the end of the 80s, there was big timber boycotts, uh, because uh, people were trying to save the forest, and they thought we should stop using the forest, and then we realized that the, you know, the, we weren't using the forest in terms of um, uh, the, the fee, the, well, making it a viable, economic, viable alternative to anything else, then it puts the forest at threat. So then you had the, a group of NGOs and uh, retailers came together to understand that that problem and the 1995 buyers group came in and that's where certification was come from. FSC and PFC was born out of that. And that, none of that was part of regulation, it was all voluntary market with the understanding okay. that um, you know, the, the supply has to be managed in some way, you can't carry on. Uh, using the resource uh, indefinitely because it's a finite resource. Right. right. So, uh, there was that that view that there has to be some protections, and then the certification world carried on for a good 10, 15 years before regulation started to catch it up um, with the uh, the uh, voluntary partnership agreements, uh, FLECT. You have the EUTR part of that process, and then you have the Lacey Act, and then you you have the uh, Australian. Uh, uh, illegal act, illegal forestry act. It's a long I don't know what, what it was, but down in Australia. So there's many of these different regulations caught up with the certification world, and that's where we are now. You know, where you have that <coughs> slight pressure between the regulations and certification. And you're seeing that with FSC, where FSC or PFC is not a green channel into the regulations, but the, the, it is it definitely helps with your risk management. So all of these things are considered. So yeah, they're, they're working in parallel now may see them come together closer as, as the regulations become more uh, mainstream. What about the so-called pressure from consumers? Do you think um, it's going to play um, a bigger role moving forward or is it still more, I guess, like a marketing stint? Uh, well, the regu now because the regulation is not necessarily a marketing ploy, it's something that companies have to do, right? And so whether they market themselves as sustainable or not. There, there is a growing uh, uh, realization that many companies are, are doing uh, right things, but they're not really promoting themselves because it's a, different, a difficult promotion, isn't it? It's like when you have the legality, when you, people get verified legal, legal for some of their sources, you don't really want to promote it because if you're not doing 100%, what does that say for the other products on your shelf? Is, are they not legal? Uh, so it's a very difficult marketing uh, balance that companies have to do. So in terms of um, consumers, it's always it's always been something that's considered. You know, are the consumers leading this? So there is a very strong argument that they're not. That many consumers don't really understand or ask these questions, or you know, to be kind to us all consumers, that we just assume that everything is done correctly. And right. We done correctly. <laughs> don't ask too many questions. And that's probably why companies don't promote it too heavily. They say, oh, we're now, we're now doing things correctly because the question is, well, what were you doing before? Um, so, 
uh, I think it, it's always been, you know, as we said from the early days, it was potentially trying to secure source and other companies trying to do the right thing. Um, some promoting themselves is that because if they've got a niche in the market, then help that helps. But on a wider scale, it's probably not something that's marketed too strongly, and the consumers just assume everything's done right already. So. Um, yeah, it's never really been driven by the consumers, I would say. It's more the retailing groups that are pushing it down the supply chain. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you because from my experience uh, uh, with this, um, I've noticed that the term sustainability is being used very loosely and it means a lot of different things to different people. So. I've heard people talk about sustainability strictly from the standpoint of like being good to the environment, but then other people would also involve this whole, um, you know, be good to the communities and like respecting labor laws and all that. But there is not a single definition of it, I feel like, because it just means different things in different contexts. And I think that's where the problem starts. There is too loose and there are some components that are being overlooked in certain contexts. Yeah, and then the resources are, are different to everybody. You know, I, I'm a forester. I started off in forestry, and my university—that was—I always remember it was the first first course at university. It was, you know, everyone in the group defined what a forest is. <laughs> find forests completely different. So, right. You know, so one person's using it for riding their bike through, another person's a forester making it for revenue, cutting the trees down. You know, one likes to walk their dog. <laughs> then, I mean, what sustainability is for each one of those different stakeholders, so it's very difficult to define sustainability because these resources get used for so many different things. About, uh, I would say a month and a half ago, I went to a forestry workshop uh, in Brussels hosted by the European Commission, and there was one big revelation that was really striking to me, is that there was apparently no agreed upon definition uh, of the forest. Like, like, what is it precisely? Like, how many trees should it have? Like, what's the density and all that? And I was like, you guys don't have an agreed upon definition. I'm like, what are we even doing with the satellite imagery then? Like, what is like, what is considered a piece of forest? <laughs> yeah, it's a tricky thing. You got the UN declaration. Of right. Forest is so that's that's one normally a default, but it is pretty loose. Um, yeah, and then that's a really good question. When we have all the geolocation monitoring using satellites, all, all of them have different algorithms of what a forest is, mm -hmm. you know, not naming any names across any of them, but some would say, you know, if it's, if it's five meters tall, 10% cover, you know, a change on that. And right. The forest others will be, you know, it's a couple of foot tall, who knows what it is in terms of that algorithm. And then so you'll get vast different results in terms of their monitoring about land use change. And then, and then if you've got algorithms that are just doing the height you're not really determining plantations from natural forest, from oil park, Exactly. Considering what land use change is happening. And then what land use change is happening because a plantation is already, it's always been programmed to be cut down because it's a crop, right? So it's, right. And that land use changes is that deforestation that was in planned agriculture over a long time frame. So all of these things need to be considered. And I would say connected to that was this whole, you know, <clears throat> I guess there are two terms, change detection and forest degradation. So there is also apparently no agreed upon definition about what forest degradation means. There are multiple ways to describe it and everybody has like a different threshold for it. And I was like, you guys are trying to make laws about this and you cannot even agree about what that means. <laughs> no, and then it's different everywhere in the world because they're all mm -hmm. different. So I remember when I was working with Rainforest Alliance, we set up a certification uh, down in Jakarta and then we worked in the forest in Kalimantan and then some of those were trying to get certified and they were still standing forest in terms of what a definition of a forest is, but um, they were degraded. But you know, there, there was an argument they could carry on being uh, certified, but then there was a threshold of what degradation is in terms of tropical forest in Kalimantan versus Sulawesi versus Africa and Latin America. So you've got to do that comparison across, and then you've got temperate forest, and what is that? It's so you know, it's not so easy to just do these benchmarks on forestry because the forest is different so many different places in the world. Again, it's been used for so many different things. So, you know, if, if you've got a forest just for trail biking, you know. <laughs> The volume of timber in that place does isn't really that 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 concern, but is is the other trails still maintained that you can ride your bike on? That would be a degradation metric 
supposed to have what's the standard volume is, so you have to define what that forest is being used for before you can really define what degradation is in terms of its use. Right. Speaking of all of this in the different countries, do you think the, uh, the EDI regulation, do you think it might render some of the countries less competitive when it comes to compliance and all that? As in, would it be easier for certain countries to comply and do you feel like there would be countries that would be left um, behind, sort of? Because I've heard there was also a petition from, I think, Southeast Asia, uh, basically saying you guys are going to just like cut us out of the market because of this regulation, because our, um, well, I guess, suppliers are going to really struggle to comply with it. Oh, that's a big question. Uh, you can see where they're coming from. Um, but you know, the, the, if you're looking at Southeast Asia or, or um, the countries around there, they, they do have a vast amount of data that's available. Uh, whether they want to make that available to the supply chain is another question. But you know, if you talk about geolocation, these things are possible. It's, it's probably the political will for some of it. Um, uh, opposed to you know, forest in northern Sweden, it's probably easier for them to define what these are under the EUDR. So um, there is that argument that's a bit more tricky for them. Uh, but um, it's, it's really down to the supply chain, if the supply chain understands where they're buying from, and it's, it's back to risk as well, of course. So it's not, um, it's not just a cut-off uh, declaration on sustainability. It is around risk and what the risks are for buying from those sources. So it doesn't really mean you, you would exclude a forest from some country in Southeast Asia, it's just down for a supply chain to define what their risks are. You can see Indonesia potentially could be slightly uh, annoyed maybe because they've done all that work on the FLECT TV voluntary partnership agreement and now they're ad having to do this in terms of what the, the goalposts is slightly changed for them and I could probably see there's slight annoyance there but um, if, you, if they took a step back I, I would have assume that they've got all the requirements to for the proof of the EU deforestation regulation there already. So uh, we may find over the next couple of years that those concerns aren't really valid. Okay. Speaking of risks, what are the actual risks that businesses are up against for not being compliant? What are the risks in terms of like, what would be the consequences uh, of them not providing correct uh, due diligence package? Well, there's the, the stipulations and the regulations with penalties, of course, if, if they carry on imported with incorrect declarations. So those are clearly defined in the regulation as it stands. At the moment, things may change. So that, that is the risk in terms of you know, confiscation, fines, or loss of business license. Um, so those stand. <laughs> Some, some pretty serious risks, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, that's worst case scenario, of course. Um, and then potentially loss of business rights. If, if you can't offer this into the marketplace, then at a, at a minimum, the, the people aren't going to be able to carry on trading with you. And so, uh, because you're going to have to ch uh, flow that information along the supply chain. So, if you haven't got that, the next person along the supply chain is assume if they're importing or exporting or trading across border, they're going to need that data as well. So there's that risk of if you haven't got good, robust data, you're going to lose some of that supply chain, that business uh, for trading. So to make a distinction here in terms of like two sides of a supply chain, so it's up to the supplier to actually be compliant, right? But it's up to the traders and operators, as in people who bring either commodities or products who made with those commodities into the European Union um, market to actually provide due diligence. Is that correct? Yeah, so along the supply chains, obviously, you've got the the regulations clearly states that it's the, it's the operator or the trader bringing the goods into the European Union or exporting out of the European Union has to sign the declarations. Um, but obviously they're not working in isolation, so anyone along their supply chain is going to have to give them the data um, to be able to make those declarations. So if everyone wants to trade along these supply chains, the data is going to have to become more readily available. And you would hope over time that it will do, because you know, there's, there's only a finite uh, amount of sources you can have, so it's 
everyone's asking the same questions over the next couple of years, you'd hope that the data is there for the source, that it is it's really available. Do you think there is any confusion or ambiguity around the terms trader and operator? Do you feel like there are companies that are just like asking themselves, am I one of those or am I not? Yeah, for sure, of course. Yeah, that's, that's going to be, but it, it, these things is with everything new coming in, it only takes a little reading and you understand it. But yeah, so you've got the, you got the large operator, large trader, and then the SMEs, as we already touched on the SMEs, or, you know, mm -hmm. So the SMEs and clearly understanding what that is and whether you're an SME as well because that's another regulation with the European Union that clearly defines what a large operator is, what an SME. So all, all of these things have to be understood. But as with all laws, you know, it only takes a little bit of uh, reading and understanding uh, to understand them. Do you think you can give me like recognizable names as examples of a trader, an operator and somebody who is not either of this? Uh, well, an operator will be someone that imports directly. Um, I don't really want to think of any names, but you know, the like large, IKEA. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, for sure. Um, I was gonna, yeah, because they're also retail. I was gonna say, yeah, some of the larger timber um, trade, larger timber importers, you know, would be bringing things in like uh, I don't know, a B Q or, or uh, someone like that, or um, Kingfisher, who are the larger operators who will be importing and then you've got the retailers may not directly import but they would trade um, within within a country or cross borders mm -hmm. uh, uh, who would be picking up that product from the the operator themselves so not directly bringing it in across the, the border but trading it thereafter um, so those those parts of the supply chain up to this point haven't really had to do too much of uh, due diligence because it's already offered and assumed and just passed along, but now they have to start doing their own due diligence. And that is the real step change where the traders, not only the operator, but the traders of that product into retail are probably going to have to do some of their own due diligence. What about like small neighborhood shops? Would they have to do any due diligence or not? Or they're like the last in the chain and they don't participate in that? Uh, uh, they, they wouldn't be traded, it depends where they are in the supply chain. So if, if they're importing, um, and uh, for sure they would have to do their own due diligence. Um, and again, it's hard to determine you know, ideally what they are in the supply chain, but you know, a good rule of thumb is that you should be understanding where you're buying these things from anyway. So to be safe, uh, uh, be able to answer to your competent authorities, a certain level of due diligence should be required, no matter where you are in the supply chain. Um, do you, um, I've heard this concerning statistic that only about, what was it, like 15 to 20 percent of those due diligence certificates or packages are actually going to be audited. Is that something, do you think, uh, that is close to the truth or um, is it actually going to be better than this? Because if it's only a quarter, less than a quarter that actually will get audited, I feel like people are going to try to... You know, not be very truthful in their declarations. Audited by who? The competent authorities? Yes. Uh, yeah, potentially. You know, you can't imagine that the competent authorities have the capacity to be able to audit everybody. Um, it's a bit the same as doing your taxes, right? <laughs> yeah, so I was going to say, yeah, yeah. I'll see that. Full audit, but you, you, the, the, the fear of having the tax might give you a full audit and you haven't been doing things correctly, that's just... It's just not worth the effort, is it? So, you, <laughs> excuse me, directly, because you just don't want to get audited when you haven't been doing things right. <laughs> right. So I think a quarter of the supply chains. I think that's pretty good. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's enough in, incentive there for people to do it. Um, when it comes to deforestation, do you think uh, the entire voluntary? carbon market is effective when it comes to conserving the forest or do you feel like it's more of a just a money making machine oh that's off the EUDR <laughs> <laughs> pivoting but I was like since we're on the deforestation topic why not uh, that's, a, that's a tricky one well you know especially as a forester <laughs> uh, carbon has been a great way of uh, so fixing a value on 
biodiversity, if you like, uh, and conservation of the forest. Because it's always that problem, you know, if, if, you, if you're not supplying in the marketplace from that forest something that you can attain a revenue from, then the carbon allows you to do the conservation um, on top of uh, just fixing the forest in terms of its, for its own value, only biodiversity value. So that's what the carbon's doing it great job because it's allowed people to really uh, conserve forests without cutting them down for any sort of speed tip the timber if that's not what they're doing that's not the main reason for that forest to be standing so yes yeah, good whether the, the offsets from those forests are making any impact in the reduction of GHG because that, that's a different question completely because you have the, uh, the issue of um, Know, leakage, permanence, um, all of these different things where, you know, forest, who says the forest is going to be standing in another hundred years when that's really the right. rotation of it, carbon forestry. Um, but, you know, is, is it making any impact? You know, I think if the forest is conserved through the use of carbon, I think that's great. Um, if that carbon is being used for offset from a company that's not doing any reductions, terms of their strategy to net zero, I think that's very bad. I would agree with that. Do you think with the way that things are going right now, there's going to be more regulation when it comes to uh, trying to stop deforestation and really, to quote you, understand where you're buying from? Um, will there be more? Um, I think we'll probably have to see where the European deforestation rate embeds in and how it, how it works. I think I uh, will watch this for the next few years and see how it shakes out before anyone's going to push the needle a bit more on regulations. It may not be on some a trade regulation like this, but it may be something on carbon, it may be communities, wherever we, we, we land on that. Uh, but for now, we're still crossing our fingers that the European deforestation regulation will come into play. You know, it's still not signed. In, in, it's meant to become uh, law in June, isn't it? And then implementation's the end of this year and then mid next following year, 2025. Uh, so we cross our fingers that happens and then we can consider what the next steps would be in terms of deforestation. Do you think there is there are any other commodities that should have been included in EUDR or is it is, does it does it have a pretty good list so far? Yes, yeah, pretty good. You could always have more um, or more products as well on the HS codes. And, you know, some of those HS codes you scratch your head. Why? Why was this not included? Why was that? <laughs> um, you know, there's the worry on oil palm. There's no products for it. It's more, it's more of the large volume trade of, of oil palm, not necessarily uh, oil palm in terms of what it how much is in a chocolate bar or something like that. So these things could be strengthened over time, but it's very difficult to track those sorts of things so you can understand why they're put in place as they are. So I, I think it's, it's pretty good. It's good that they've uh, included rubber um, uh, and some of those other considerations. So I, I think the commodity list as it stands now as a beginning is good, and then over time it probably can be increased. Okay. In your experience, companies that are trying to um, establish the uh, sustainable sourcing, what is the biggest challenge or what are the biggest challenges that they face at the beginning of this whole journey? Um, getting the data from their supply chains. Okay. Um, as always, you know, if you're quite far removed from the forest or the farm or wherever it may mm -hmm. be, it's very difficult to go back through the supply chains. If you've got three, four, five tiers of supply, one to understand what that supply is because up at this point you know to try and understand all your different flows in your supply chain it's never really been done by many companies and if you're a smaller company then it's going to be difficult and then getting your supply chain to understand what the data is that you're trying to get from them um, is hard so it takes a lot of effort that's what we do with our clients is work for with them to go back through supply chains, audit their supply chains, have that communication, explain what's going on. All of this takes a lot of time, effort, um, and money, of course, because it's time. Uh, so the more time it takes you, the harder it is, the more expensive it is. And then getting back to the forest resource. Um, many companies, it's gonna be hard for them to understand what a polygon is, what a point is, how do you uh, 
secure that in terms of uh, what platforms you put it on, how do you monitor it, and then you know the regulations requiring you to understand how the forest resource is managed in terms of indigenous rights, community rights, um, deforestation over time. So all of these things is another skill set that's going to be required if you're a company that trades timber or builds furniture. You've never really had to understand what forestry operations or farming is all about. You're going to have to have that skill set. Gotcha. In your experience, obviously, if you don't have it on top of your mind, that's okay. But I'm wondering if you have like a list of, I don't know, top three, top five countries where the ratio of sustainable sourcing is pretty high or as in like there is a pretty good choice of um, sustainable sourcing partners. Uh, I don't know. Uh, nothing on the top of my head because there's so many. It's so varied different commodities um, there's different strengths you know we're working with um, groups in Africa in terms of you know, coffee and there's vast amounts of data available uh, going into the supply chain so you know and then you're in uh, Indonesia you know, the forestry operations in Indonesia have been working on these things for a long time so there's great data sets down there for people and uh, you've got customary rights working down there so you had that right for many uh, groups in Indonesia there's understanding there so it's, it's difficult to say uh, to pick one or two out clearly above the rest because it depends what commodity it is you know whereabouts it is in the world to be able to just say yeah they're good and they're bad there it is and then you've got the European Union of course they're, right. they're part of that also you know you're trading within the European Union across borders so the foreign the data sets in Europe are, are great, so um, it's hard to say. I think it's down to the supply chains themselves to understand, to make themselves a good supply chain, not necessarily the resource itself. There is a, a list that I, I think is called like Dirty Dozen when it comes to some of the like fruit and vegetables, and it means uh, products that uh, notoriously use a lot of like uh, pesticides and other harmful elements uh, during their cultivation. Is there a list like that on the commodities? And like, I don't know, 35 <laughs> that uh, are probably the most prone to not very sustainable sourcing? Again, it, it depends on history as well, where, where you're looking. Um, you, know, you, you, can, you, could, you could look at uh, oil palm and others, but then you, a lot of the deforestation has already happened. So they've got the cutoff date. So now you've said, right. hang on, there's no more deforestation because it's already happened. So now that now it's suddenly sustainable or uh, same with the other commodities in terms of land use. So you know, if, if you look back in history, then it's bad, but it's, it's a snapshot where we are now. It's, it's, it, it could be equally well good because there's no more deforestation happening uh, in terms of pesticide. You know, many, many of these, uh, these crops that have to be used grown out of season or in season, the high volumes mono mono crops or you know, these have large impacts on the on the ground and you know, disease because you've got mono crops or uh, you, then you have a large use of pesticides and herbicides and then you've got the pressures of uh, GMO coming in. So yeah, there's a vast array of different crops and others you could eat. <laughs> so this is part of what that regulations trying to you know, a sway is they say you've got you've got your pesticides, you've got your herbicides, you've got all of these different things you need to consider. And that's why the supply chains have to really start understanding where they're buying things from and how how it's managed. Um, when it comes to the uh, compliance uh, with the local regulation and all that, is that notoriously also uh, complex to carry out? Or oh, isn't like the due diligence about the uh, local regulations hard to carry out on top of that whole, you know, satellite piece? Oh, sorry, so you've got the satellite piece and then the supply chains. Yeah, well, you've got to understand the supply chain 100% to be able to get to the resource to be able to do your satellites, right? Because if you don't do the supply chain management, you can't get back to where the resource is to be able to map it. Um, so you have to start with the supply chains and yeah, it's highly complex. Uh, some of these companies, uh, some of these supply chains for the commodities got so many different inputs coming in to them to unpick that supply chain is going to take a lot of effort. So I think, yeah, it's, it's down to 
understanding your supply chains is, is the is the main crux of this. So once you've got to the resource, then the, there's enough data available um, to be able to do the monitoring and platforms of the geolocation and mapping. Now, we're very lucky nowadays. You've got these satellites taking pictures every day, twice a day. You can monitor on platforms which aren't too expensive to use. So once you have your polygon set, the, the monitoring of the, the, the resource itself is pretty easy. There is usually uh, the, the underlying issue when, the, when I think it comes to satellite data uh, is actual land ownership rights. I've heard about it specifically in Brazil. We keep hearing about it very often is that uh, sometimes uh, there are like claims from multiple parties for the same piece of land. How do you guys deal with that problem? Yeah, it's down to risk and understanding what that is. And so we, uh, you shouldn't only be relying on satellite imagery. There should be some right. auditing on the ground for these these resources, uh, forest and agriculture. And yeah, there's many different claims. There's always fights over the tenureship. Um, and this is why, you know, the, the supply chain, the buyers should understand what, how the resources are managed and what pressures they're under and what the community rights are. So not only the community's legal right, but their customary right. And so understand what customary laws are in that, that part of the world, wherever you're buying from. And then you have the indigenous groups on top of that mm -hmm. uh, to make it very clear that communities are very different to indigenous, but they all have different rights and understanding. And so you know, if, if you're in a part of the world and a resource that you know there's um, multiple claims on those on that land with much up, uh, up, upset for different stakeholders, then some auditing should be done in terms because it's going to be a high risk resource. Um, and and you know, ideally not just excluded from your supply chain because it would be good to, if it's possible, to work with the, the groups to make sure that those that are most needed uh, are maintained and the, the revenue stream to go into them um, to understand. How to do that um, is, again, a, a skill that some of these supply chain groups are going to have to bring in-house. Gotcha. At Double Helix, do you guys specialize in certain geographies or certain industries, or are you um, pretty agnostic and you could pretty much work with everyone? Uh, we try and work with everyone. It, it, it started off as an organization that's focused on forestry and timber, mm -hmm. um, and that's where it's most happy. Um, but uh, there is the ability to work in the agricultural group as well, uh, commodities. Um, in terms of geography, uh, we're, we're strong in Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, uh, with representation down in Africa. Gotcha. What's the best way for the listeners to get in touch with you if they would like to understand where they're buying from? Uh, you know, our website, obviously, or LinkedIn. Uh, I'm sure you'll share our uh, details. Yes, we'll put all the links in the in the yeah, so description. Go to our website or our emails. So we're all there. Um, Darren, myself, and other groups are there on top on the site. Of course, catch us on LinkedIn or give us a ring if you're going to go old school. <laughs> yeah, I feel like nobody does this anymore. No, <laughs> <laughs> may not answer it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Adam. I think there's been a very insightful episode. We're going to put all of the links uh, uh, to Double Helix in the episode description. Uh, are there like any final words of wisdom that you would like to share with the listeners? No, just, yeah, thanks for inviting us. Um, I wouldn't get too scared from the regulation. It's, it's, it does seem sort of daunting, but with all these things, just a bit of effort is, is achievable and easy. And, you know, there's groups like Double Helix and many others that can offer these services to understand the supply chains and how to manage those and Orbify is there for the geolocation and that's why we're really interested and excited working with Orbify because we love your platform and it's Thank you. the way you've developed it, the user interface is so user friendly. There's many other platforms where, you know, oh my god, I don't know what I'm doing, I just messed that up. <laughs> and just leave it. But this one really worked quite well so we're, thanks for having us along on your podcast and um, we look forward to working with you more as we bring more of our customers into you. Same here, same here.